These are three things I learned about my grandpa Sakai from reading this book. How I turned a thousand dollars into a million in real estate all in my spare time, right? It was that, that's the dream, isn't it? That's the dream. All right. So let's dive in a little bit on the history and background of my grandpa because why you care otherwise, right? So <laughs> we're going to just go a little bit into the background of my grandfather and my family. Uh, we're going to talk about this book, which is a very interesting book. If you're in real estate, you should read this if you haven't. It's very interesting. Um, and then we're going to talk about the three things that I think anybody could utilize from what I learned really about him uh, by reading this book. All right. So my grandfather was born on 10, 10, 10 before it was trendy. So 1910, October 10th, 1910 to be exact. And uh, he was, he's Japanese. So he was born in Japan. He lived most of his life in the US, um, but he'd go back and forth quite a bit. He had a little bit of an accent. He always thought that it was much thicker than it really was. Um, and to be blunt, he was my favorite grandparent. He played with me. The others didn't. They were all very sweet, but they, you know, it's sweet to me. You know, they weren't so sweet to my parents and stuff, but, <laughs> but, um, but my grandfather played with me. And I just have great memories of us drawing and playing with stamps and playing, I'm teacher, you're a student, you do what I tell you to do, you know, that kind of stuff. And he always would smile and make me feel good. And just, he was just great. So my grandpa died when I was 11. And so I didn't really get to know him as a teenager or an adult. I didn't get to ask him anything about who he was and what, what did he find important or any of that. And um, he was a very important figure in my life. And, and it, I've started to get more curious about who, who was he really, you know, other than this wonderful man that I remember, who was he? And uh, so I've started talking to my dad more and more about, about him. And it's really interesting because he accomplished something that so many people are trying to get to now, way before it was trendy. And that was retiring early. He retired at age 54. 1964, he retired at age 54. And he loved golf like every other man out there now. Well, it's like for my husband who doesn't. But but he would golf. He would watch golf. He would putt in the garage. He would do all that stuff. I mean, he just loved golf. And he loved playing with me. And he just you know enjoyed life for about 25, 26 years before he passed of not having to work, which is which back then was quite a, an achievement. People weren't living that long in retirement, right? And so I started asking more questions of my dad, like, what, what happened? How did, how did he do that? Like, what did he say? And so he told me about this book. And I said, oh, this book, you know, do you have this book? And he said, no, but birthday present, he got this for me. So thank you, dad. Um, and I read it. And it's very interesting. Um, I would say it's probably the most detailed book I have ever read. Even as a financial professional, I skimmed through a lot of it because it was very detailed and quite frankly, kind of boring for me since I wasn't lo looking to learn how to do real, how to become a millionaire in real estate. Right. Um, but I would say it's a very interesting book for anybody who is interested in real estate, not to copy this and say, this is my Bible. Like my grandfather did. Although, you know, what's interesting is I was just talking to my dad on the timeline to make sure I had everything right. And my grandfather actually started doing this before this book came out. This book came out in 1959 and he retired in 1964 and he started real estate before this. So um, it's kind of funny that this was just kind of like a backup for him to use after he had already kind of started the process. But anyhow, this book really gives you the strategy of how to invest in in real estate, in multi-unit apartments, and how to keep moving up the ladder. Um, and I would say there's some things obviously out, out of date in this. There's one thing that they keep calling trading to trade up, you know, and I'm assuming that's 1031 exchange, but if anybody, if there's CPAs or tax people out there that know a different story, I would love to hear, you know, if there's something else out there that I don't know about. Um, but he goes through everything. He goes through what should be in your contracts. He goes through how to how to toss a tenant out. He goes through how to hire a manager of the apartment, how to fire that person, what you should wear when you're trying to sell a or you know, trying to rent out a unit, what you say, 
this is what your financial statement should look like. I mean, it's extremely detailed. He even goes through how you should inspect an apartment complex to make sure that it doesn't have too much work to do because he's a big proponent of you buy low, you invest money into building up the apartment, you know, putting value into it, you know, painting it, restoring things, things like that in order to push the value up faster in order to sell it or trade it in his words to the next bigger units, you know, bigger amount of unit apartment complex that you're going to do. Um, and so he even tells you like what to look at in plumbing and stuff. I mean, it's just amazing how much details in this book. Um, but I, like I said, it's a very interesting book. If you really are interested in real estate, I would say read that for the very bare minimum that it will show you how complicated real estate is. Real estate is not an easy investing investment. I don't care what anybody tells you. So what are the three things that I learned from my grandfather? And what do I think that people could utilize in their own investing strategies or really their own financial strategies? Not if you just want to, I mean, I'm not telling you, you have to become a millionaire in real estate. That is not my goal. That is not our strategy personally. So that's not what I'm telling you. I'm telling you what you can learn about investing in general and how to get to your goals when it comes to finances. So the first thing that I really learned about my grandfather was he had a goal, he knew what he wanted, and he had a strategy and he stuck to that strategy. So his goal was, I want to retire as early as possible. That's it. That was his goal. And he said, I'm going to get there as fast as I can. He put his strategy in place and he worked that strategy. He did what this book said, and he'd done some of it before he retired in 1964, right? So essentially he did what this book said, which was buy an apartment complex, you know, make, put some value into it, sell it, move into the next one or sell it or trade it or whatever they want to say to the next apartment complex and so on and so forth. And my grandfather was a very shy man. I mean, he hardly would talk to anybody but me, really. And he didn't even talk to me that much. I was a kid. So there you go. But um, essentially, he would, you know, he did all this stuff. He was a hard-nosed businessman because it was his dream and nothing was getting in his way. And I think we don't put enough emphasis on what our bigger goals are. We tend to fill in our lives with these things that aren't really that important and filter out these big goals. But if you have a really strong goal, strong, big goal, I, I, I'm a big believer you can get there. You just have to have a strategy and take action and be willing to like move in and out of it. If it's not working for you, do something a little bit different, but keep that ball rolling. You've got to keep going. You've got to get started and just do something and have a strategy and work that strategy, right? So the second thing I learned was that he was very patient. This was in the book here, it's an eight to 10 year strategy. I believe he was investing longer than that. I think he was doing it more like 15 years. My dad might correct me on that, but something like that. Like he was, he was working his plan for a while and you have to have patience when you do things like this, he didn't take any money out of these places until he finally sold in the seventies, his last apartment complex. So you really need to have patience on this stuff, because if you don't have patience, then you're never going to get there. If you expect instant success, that stock's going to instantly go up. This is instantly going to give me a rate of return. I'm going to get money so fast. It's just not going to work in the long run. You might make a lot of money in a short time, but that's not a long-term strategy. Patience is a virtue for a reason. And my grandfather had a lot of it, especially being married to my grandmother, but he had a lot of it <laughs> because he worked his plan. And so um, I think that that's a big virtue. Uh, my dad was also just telling me that he you know, invested in stocks afterwards. And what he did was he chose a couple of big name corporations that paid a good dividend and he held on to them forever. And he just lived off the dividends. 
that is that is a patient strategy. I mean, he went through dips in the market, issues going on with the companies, all that stuff. He just held fast. He did not stop what his strategy was. That is a very rare quality right now because we let our emotions dictate things. And my, my grandfather, I'm sure, could be a very emotional man, but he stuck to his guns. Patience. Patience is a virtue. The third thing is he made some sacrifices. Now, my father and uncle would say that maybe he made some sacrifices for them as well, because my my dad always tells me that he had two pairs of pants that he could wear, and that was it. And he could never get any more unless he ruined one of the pairs. And then my grandfather was mad. And, you know, obviously as a child, that's not something you, you want to be able to have some things that you want, not just only what you absolutely need kind of thing. Um, and my grandfather definitely made family sacrifices as well, but he made big sacrifices for himself too. He did not go back to Japan till after he retired. So he didn't go visit his family for a long time. They did not take big trips. They did not own a home. They owned these apartment buildings and that was it. They lived in those. He sacrificed where they lived. They lived in some bad areas in Los Angeles. And he sacrificed that. I'm sure as an Asian man in some of these areas, walking home from work or being in the car, it was not the safest areas to be in. And so he made some sacrifices. And I think that that is very much overlooked. We're kind of in this world where we think we can have it all. We can live up life now and we can also live it up in retirement and everything's just going to work out good. And especially the movement of, I'll just make more money. You know, that's a, that's a lovely thought, but when you make more money, that doesn't mean that you've changed what you're doing. <laughs> Oftentimes when we make more money, we just push our lifestyle, lifestyle drift. I've talked about this before. Then you're big, then you want more and you spend more and then you don't have any more money to save because we've, you know, want bigger. Getting more income is not always the key to things. Sometimes it's about sacrifice. And my husband and I have had to make sacrifices to get as far along as we have with our financial journey. We're working towards that retire early or financial independence as early as possible. Um, does not mean I'm going to retire early, clients, I promise you. Um, but, but, you know, we're working towards financial independence and we've had to make sacrifices to do that. And so sometimes you have to sacrifice some things. Does that mean you don't ever get to go on vacation? No. But why not choose a really nice vacation? Stop going on these like little weekend getaways to celebrate and treat yourself and choose a really nice vacation. And maybe you go on a really nice vacation every couple of years rather than every single you know, year you go on two or three of these mini things that cost you $2,000 and you don't even remember you went. And actually treat yourself to the thing that you're going to remember, the experience that you're going to remember, the experience your family that goes with you is going to remember. And, and stop these little things. Sacrifice those for the bigger life. Live a bigger life. You deserve it. And sacrifice now often means wonderful things in the future. And that future doesn't have to be retirement. It can be in three years two years from now, when you get to go on that cruise to Hawaii that you always wanted to go on, you have saved for that. You have sacrificed for that. And man, it tastes sweet when you do that. So in conclusion, have a really good goal and put a strategy in place and just go for it. Two, be patient. Patience is such a virtue. Gary Vaynerchuk tells, talks about this all the time. And I totally agree with him. Be patient. It's not going to happen overnight, and that's okay. Just keep moving forward. Third, you're going to make sacrifices. You dream big, you're going to have to make some sacrifices to get to your dream, but you can get there. If you don't believe you can get there, then you're not going to sacrifice anything. So One Vision Retirement, we are here to help you get to your dreams if it's through real estate, which I'm not going to read this book again, but <laughs> if it's through real estate or something else. We are here to help you get to your big goal in life 
and maybe that's retiring early. And we specialize in that. So give us a call, schedule a get to know you call. We're happy to help. One Vision Retirement, your retirement in 2020 Vision.